Let me start off by saying tonight, listen, the devil doesn't own anything in Michigan. The devil doesn't own music. He doesn't own media. He doesn't own days. He doesn't own holidays. He doesn't own celebrations. He doesn't own styles. He doesn't own anything. He's a father of lies. All he does is manipulate, lie, and try to do cheap copies of what, what God does. Amen. God created the, the days. He hung the stars and the moon in the sky. God created that. The devil doesn't own one square inch of this state. And so that's the type of Christians we're going to be. Now, you can be a defeated believer and have a, a, a real big view of the enemy, but that's not how I'm going to live. As for me and my house, we're going to magnify the Lord and in doing so, reflect him in and through our lives. And so that's just who we're going to be because we don't have any other option. Amen. You can attend a defeated church, but this isn't one of them. You can be around defeated believers, but not in this house because our eyes are set on the hills where our hope comes from because our hope comes from the Lord and defeated powerless Christianity has done a great disservice to our country, but no more, not any longer. Hallelujah. Amen. Now listen, when you need a miracle, you ain't looking to a dead church. You are looking to an alive church. When you need God to do something in your life, you aren't looking for a defeated believer, but a believer that's grabbed a hold to the hem of his garment. I didn't say perfect. I said committed to his lordship and the power that he provides. Amen. You see, the Holy Spirit wants his church back, so we're going to give it to him. Because it was his to begin with. The devil doesn't own anything. For this reason, the Son of God was made manifest to destroy the works of darkness. And that's how I want you to feel when you rally here on Sunday mornings. I want you to feel like, yeah, we destroyed th some things. We broke some chains. We broke some bondage and broke some limitations and broke off some false healings and broke off some false words. You know, we broke some stuff today. And, you know, people have allowed the enemy to build false monuments and false idols, but there's no king like Jesus. There's no authority like Jesus. There's no room I've walked into that he isn't already seated on high in heavenly places. No, we are demolishing every argument and high thought that comes against the kingship and the rulership of Jesus Christ. And you should feel a little rattled this evening. You should feel a little agitated. This is dangerous. I feel like I'm running into traffic and it feels a little discombobulated. No, we we are not playing safe church because lives hang in the balance and this counts for eternity and we are destroying the works of darkness. How many of you believe that here tonight? Now Luke chapter 2, that's just my introduction here tonight. Luke 2, I want to tell you a story of Jesus that I think is important in your life. I love Luke because he's a church historian He's a doctor, he's a Gentile, and he writes about Jesus in a way that's forensic. He includes details that other people don't. And I love the story that's told in Luke chapter 2 because it tells us something key about the life of Jesus. Because as he was, so are we. And we are in this world and we are living, breathing ambassadors of another kingdom. And so the more we understand about the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, and the kingdom of Jesus, the better we are in replicating that kind of stuff in this type of place. So I want to tell you the story of Jesus. Now, Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 39. The Bible says this, when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. And Jesus grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. Let me ask you a question this evening, friend. If Jesus had to grow, then what is your excuse? If Jesus had to grow then what is my excuse? Sometimes we have this over-deified view of Christ, like he just comes out of the womb all dressed proper with a halo doing miracles. Now, he was always God, and he is always God, but he was also fully man. And he submitted himself to the natural process of growth and maturity for your benefit and for mine in a way that we could look at his life and go, as he was, so are we. And the Bible 
Bible says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 20 that even Jesus grew. And I'm preaching on that subject tonight. Even Jesus grew. Would you pray with me tonight? Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. God, I thank you for what you're doing and the lives of those under the sound of my voice here tonight, God. Lord, I pray that this word tonight, that it would bring life to every person under the sound of my voice here tonight, Lord, that you would minister grace to them in this place and those watching by live stream. And God, we thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said amen, amen. and amen. Even Jesus grew. The word grow in the Greek, it means this. It means to undergo significant development. To be transformed, to advance, to increase, and to change for the better. Here's my favorite definition, to lengthen out by hammering. You see, if growth was easy, everybody would be doing it, yet most people don't because it's not easy and it doesn't feel good. And most of the time, it feels like getting beat with a hammer and being lengthened out. You see, real growth and real transformation happens in your life when you take the breakthrough of the altar and you marry it to the follow through of Monday through Saturday. And see, that's what we have been invited into, not just momentary breakthrough in a charged environment, it's consistent consistent daily follow through by which that breakthrough turns into life altering maturity and development. Now watch because it gets better. In the spiritual realm, there are only two options. We're either advancing or we are retreating. Hear me tonight. You are not built to hold ground. You are built to take ground. And some of us have become bored in our faith because we are occupying instead of developing. We're living in neutral instead of advancing. We are simply existing instead of being continually transformed. You see, if you're not growing, you're dying. Friend, growth isn't a good idea. It's what we owe God and what we owe others as a result of our salvation. The best way that I honor you is by growing me. It's actually what I owe God in response to salvation as well because it was a free gift. But can I tell you here tonight, even free gifts, their development is costly. That's why when Jesus is making the call to discipleship, he said, if any man desires to follow me, take up your cross daily and follow me. No, the gift is free. It's not based on your work. It's based on his work. No, the gift is free, but the development, it will cost you everything. And I think in an attempt to draw crowds, oftentimes we in the Western church, we have downplayed the cost of following Jesus. No, this costs you everything. It costs you your time, your money, your attention. It costs you your dignity, your affiliation, your part partisanship. It costs you everything. But Jesus didn't promise you an easy life, but a worthwhile life. It's worth it to follow Jesus. And here's what we're living for. Well done, good and faithful servant. Not well done, good and faithful pastor, leader, teacher, apostle, prophet, evangelist, business owner, CEO, mom, dad, no. Well done, good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. Give God a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. And when you position your heart to receive the affirmation of the one that you worship, then you are not moved by what the crowds call you when they don't agree with you. Oh, well, they're going to call me a hater. Okay. They're going to disagree and be upset. They already are. No, I'm not living for their affirmation. I'm living for his. Well done, good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. There's a mandate on your life to grow. Now watch this. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. Be fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Colossians 2.19, from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Acts chapter 19 and verse 20, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. 
2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 15. But having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And here's what I've found. What people want is a church to do everything for them without requiring anything of them. You see, people want a great pastor until he expects them to be great Christians. Amen? Now here's the deal. There's a heavenly mandate on your life to grow. And if you don't engage with the mandate for personal growth, you will often feel left behind by a church that is responding to the mandate for corporate growth. Scripture says this to the increase of his kingdom and his government. There is no end. Are you awake here tonight? People want to be a kingdom church, but they don't want to respond to the mandate to grow. But can I tell you, sometimes the Lord takes you through deepening seasons and sometimes he takes you through widening seasons because he knows you need bro both. You see, in order to grow tall, we must first grow deep. And you know, we want to reverse, we want the reverse of what Jesus had. Jesus had 30 years of private development for three and a half years of public ministry, but it changed the world. And you know, we want 14 seconds from a YouTube clip and then 45 years of fame and money. Can I tell you, if you find yourself in a wilderness, if you find yourself in waiting, if you find yourself in hiddenness, guess what? You're in really good company because the greater the development, the greater the destiny God has for your life. No, I'm not hitting fast forward on development because we need it and we never graduate out of it. Your destiny isn't the end of your development. It's simply the next stage that your development takes you to. No, we are a lifelong committed developing disciples of King Jesus. How many of you believe that here tonight? You see, you don't get a degree and finish your discipleship. I'll never forget the time I heard somebody that went through a discipleship program and they said these words. They said, I have officially completed my discipleship. <laughs> really? Well, you just failed. You got to start all over again. So you don't receive a degree and finish your discipleship. You don't receive a title from a church and then end your discipleship. No, when you sign up to say yes to Jesus, what you made was a daily choice to pick up your cross and follow him. For if a man desires to save his life, he will lose it. But if he loses his life for my sake, he will find it. Here's the deal. There's a mandate on your life for growth. This church, I want you to think of it like a greenhouse. You and I are the plants and the environment is right and the ingredients is right and the sunlight is right. And we've got a great gardener named Jesus, but the initiative to grow is on us. We've got to be willing to grow. We've got to be willing to let God change us. We've got to be willing to allow God to take things out of us. Now, what I found, what I found is that people, they often think about growth the same way they think about prophecy. Like, if I get a prophetic word from somebody, regardless of what I do, God will just magically accomplish it on his behalf. Can I tell you something here tonight? Prophecy is an invitation into obedience. If I were to give you a word today and say, hey friend, I see something on your life. The Lord says he's raising you up to be a musician. Uh, he's going to give you a voice to lead worship, so on and so forth. And you just thought, well, I hope that God just drops it off on my doorstep like a leprechaun with a pot of gold. Lord, I just receive. Thank you. No, my prophetic word over your life was an invitation for you to Google voice lessons. Amen. It was an invitation for you to Google how to play the piano. 
It wasn't a guarantee that God was going to magically electric shock talent into your life. No, prophecy is an invitation into obedience. It's not a guarantee of an outcome. And that's the same way we think about growth. No, it is an invitation into obedience. And I don't have the option not to grow because when I signed up to follow Jesus, I said, not my will, but your will be done. How many of you believe that here tonight? Even Jesus grew. And if he grew, then what's our excuse? You know, you hear all sorts of different things as a pastor. People, people say this. I can't make friends. Well, have you tried being friendly? I'm happy to be at church. Did you tell your face? I'm used to going to a church where everybody knows my name. Well, how many names have you learned? I don't feel like I can grow. Well, are you hungry? You know, sometimes we make it the responsibility of the pastor to do all the spiritual work for us, hoping to, by osmosis, magically develop based on somebody else's due diligence. We want other people to do the work and then have someone to blame when it doesn't go well. But watch what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He said, brothers and sisters, he said, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly or carnal, mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, because you were not ready for it. Indeed, you still are not ready. You are still worldly or carnal. For there is jealousy and strife and division among you. Are you not worldly, acting like mere Christians? Can I tell you, friend, the greatest threat to the church is not progressivism. It's not culture. It's not liberals. The greatest threat to the church is worldly Christians who should be on meat, but they're still drinking milk. And that's why Paul said, he said, I would love to give you more, but you're not ready for it. I would love to move beyond the elementary principles of the faith to something more, but you're not ready for it. He's writing to believers here. He's writing to the church of Corinth. You see, they have Jesus in their heart, but they got the world in their mind. I'll say that again. They got Jesus in their heart, but the world in their mind. And it's not just that Jesus grew, but watch this. Scripture says that he grew in wisdom and grace. He grew in wisdom and grace. Well, what's the reason for growing in wisdom and grace? Well, because it's likely that God is going to lead you into a season where you're going to need both in your life. But can I tell you something here tonight? God won't ever take you into a season of testing without first placing you in an incubator of development. You see, knowledge is knowing what to say. Wisdom is knowing whether or not to say it. Knowledge is knowing how to use a gun, but wisdom is knowing when to use a gun. Knowledge recognizes a problem, but wisdom knows how to fix it, for wisdom is the application of knowledge. Proverbs 9 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Bible says that the Lord by wisdom founded the earth. The Bible says that through wisdom a house is built. The Bible says my people are destroyed for a lack of vision or wisdom or knowledge. Proverbs 23 and 23 says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom. Jesus, he grew in wisdom. Scripture says this in James. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask and the Lord will give liberally and without reproach. Now, as a church, we are growing in wisdom. The Lord has given us wisdom to navigate political waters, cultural waters, social waters, financial waters. The Lord has given us wisdom, but we have to grow in it. Scripture doesn't say that he grew just in wisdom, but he also grew in grace. Now hear me tonight. I don't think that grace grows. I don't think that wisdom grows. I think that we grow. Watch, I think the same amount of grace today that you have today is the same amount that you had when you got saved. But what it means to grow in grace is to grow in the wisdom of applying what you already have to your current circumstance. Scripture says this, you've already received everything that you need pertaining to life and godliness. You've already got it. But what you need is the wisdom on how to apply it in your life. 
You know, it's like having a, a bank account that you don't know how to access. And then all of a sudden, somebody gives you the password to your bank account. No, you still have the same amount of money you've always had in there. But now, all of a sudden, you've got access to use it. You see, I've already been invited to sit in heavenly places. I've already been invited to approach the throne of grace in my time of need. I've already been invited to share in his glory. I've already been invited to have his renewed mind. But we live below our level of invitation and then pray for things that we already have. I'm going to say that again. We live below our level of invitation and then pray for things that we already have. We say, God, I need more grace. God is saying, I've already already given you grace. We say, God, I need more mercy. He says, I've already given you mercy. God, I need victory. He's saying, I've already given you victory. And so often we pray for things that is already in our possession. No, we already have it. I already have grace. I already have favor. I already have wisdom. I already have knowledge. And the more that I grow in it, the better I am to apply what's already been there to my current circumstance. God, I need you to put more grace in my life. God is saying, I've already put the max amount. God, I need more of you. God is saying, no, I need more of you. I don't think grace grows. I think that we grow. I don't think that Jesus had more grace at 13 than he had at 12. But I think that Jesus grew up in the grace that the father had provided for him. Uh, For example, I'm a son of God through faith in Jesus Christ. But watch, my sonship isn't increasing or decreasing. It exists as an established fact, but I grow in my sonship by deepening my understanding and application of what it means to be a child of God. I am not more a son of God today than I was when I was 17 when I gave my heart to Jesus, but I am better at applying his identity to my life because I have grown up in my sonship. And this is what it means to grow in grace. I'm not going to live in shame because I've grown in grace. I'm not going to live in condemnation because I've grown in grace. I'm not going to live in rejection or abandonment because I've grown in grace. I'm not going to live in insecurity or doubt because I've grown in grace. Now watch verse 41. Verse 41, it says this. It says his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem and Joseph and his mother did not know it. You see, you haven't been raised in church unless you've been forgotten at church by your parents at least a time or two in life. Greg said, amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. I experienced that the other day. (laughs) Verse 44. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Hear me so clearly, friend. You are not left behind. You are strategically hidden by God for a season of supernatural development. Some of the greatest growth in your life happens in seasons of separation from the crowd. You see, it looked as if Jesus had been left behind, but instead he had been strategically positioned by the Father for supernatural development. And one of the things you must wage war against is the anxiety of feeling like you have been left behind. Like everyone is zooming past you, like everyone is living their best life and you're just waiting for yours to begin. No, God has you right where he wants you to be. He hasn't forgotten about you. Your season is coming. So it's time to stop complaining and start developing because this is your time for growth. Hallelujah. Amen. Give God one more hand clap of praise. We don't, we don't do golf claps in here. Amen. And you know, that's one of the dangers of social media is that we see everyone else's highlights 
And we see where everyone else is going and we can feel like, when is it my time? When is it my time to get a promotion? When is it my time to get recognized? When is it my time? But my identity does not come from being seen by the world, but instead by being hidden in Jesus Christ. And can I tell you here tonight, being hidden is one of the best positions that you could ever had, that you could ever have. As I am hidden in him and his power overshadows my life, then all of a sudden what he walked in, I walk in as well. For surely goodness and mercy and favor follows me all the days of my life. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So please don't compare where you are to where somebody else is because you don't know their journey and you don't know their story. And Jesus warns in the parable of the seed and the sower, he says that stuff that comes up too quickly, the cares of life choke it out because the roots are shallow. So if God is going to do a, a, if God is doing a deep work, then just stay there. You know, so often we want God to just, just speed up the process of development and just speed up the process of sanctification and just speed up the trials and speed up the tribulations. But God, he's got to bring us through that. He's got to bring us through the fiery trial, not to destroy us, but to purify our faith. And God said that you shall come forth as pure as gold. And so don't rush what God is doing, but rather submit to the process and say, God, I don't understand it right now, but I don't have to understand because I know that you are sovereign and I know that you're working out all things for your good and for my good. And so I'm going to abide and I'm going to remain and I'm going to stay hidden in you and trust you to bring me through to the other side. How many of you believe that here tonight? Hallelujah. You know, when you get anxiety about God keeping his end of the agreement, then you almost always step out of line and create an Ishmael when you should have waited for an Isaac. God must need my help because his promise isn't coming through. God must need my strategy. Let me just help him out here. No, listen, God knows where you're going and in his grace, he's doing a deep work in your life because when you get there, it's important, important that you can blossom and that you can flourish there. God's not wanting you to just be a shooting star. The Bible says in the book of Jude that they were the false teachers of his day, that they were like shooting stars. They, they come out of darkness and they provide a, a small glimmer of light and then they just disappear. God doesn't want you to be a shooting star. He wants you to be a city on a hill for all the world to see. God wants his light to shine in you and through you, not just a burst of energy. God wants you to persevere so that he can do great and mighty things. Good things, they take time. And so we've got to submit to the will of God and say, God, I don't know why I'm going through this. I thought it was going to be easy. I thought it was going to be simple. I thought it was going to be a straight shot to success. And God said, no, I've got to take things out of you. I got to take people out of your life. I've got to break you. I've got to mold you. I've got to shape you because there's things in you that not even you know about, but I know about them. I search deep within your heart and I want to purify even the deepest parts of your heart. Hallelujah. If Jesus grew, then how much more do we need to grow? Hallelujah. Glory to God. See, a lot of people build things with their gift, but destroy them with their character. Because they prayed for a widening instead of thanking God for a deepening. We're growing deep and we're growing wide. God says, I know the potential of your life. He knows the potential of your gift. He knows the potential of your talent. And so God in his grace says, let me go deep. Now going deep isn't impressive to anybody in the crowd. But one of the key parts of your development is breaking your addiction to the approval of the crowd so that God in his mercy will do things that other people don't even care about because what he's after is your heart. God wants to change your heart. And so God's got to bring you to a place where you say, I really don't care what the crowd says because I'm not living for the affirmation of the crowd. I'm living for the affirmation of the one that I worship. And so I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus looking on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. Hallelujah. He's after the deep things. Hallelujah. Now watch verse 48. It says, so when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? 
Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And it's funny, the Bible says they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. You see, the longer you walk with Jesus, the more he will say things to you that you don't understand. One of the most profound things that Jesus said to his disciples is that you do not know what I'm doing now, but later you will. And if you make your understanding the altar that you worship at, you will miss out on your development. His ways are not your ways. His thoughts are high above because he sees things that you don't. And he has a perspective that you don't. And that's why. So I'm going to trust that the one who began my story is going to be faithful to finish my story. And even if I don't understand now, there might be a day later that I will. But I'm going to allow the one who framed the universe, the universe to hold my destiny in his hands. Hallelujah. I don't understand, but I don't need to because that's not the business that we're in. I'm not in the business of my understanding, but instead of receiving a peace that surpasses my understanding. Verse 51, it says this. It says, then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. It's an interesting verse. Again, it says he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. That word subject, it means to place under or to be submitted to. Now, we don't like to talk about submission in our culture because it's become a dirty word. Submission is not, I'm always right and you're always wrong. Submission is not, you must agree with all of my preferences and see the world exactly how I see it. Submission is not a domineering spirit that can't ever admit that they're wrong because if submission is force, it's not submission, it's control. Submission is a trust that God has placed people in your life that are seeing things that you are and can help you avoid unnecessary pitfalls in your life. You see, you're a part of a community, you're a part of a family, and you've got privileges, but you've also got responsibilities. And the best way you honor the person you're sitting next to at church is by making the decision I'm going to grow on an individual basis. I'm not going to blame everyone else. I'm not going to blame my family history. I'm not going to blame mom and dad. I'm not going to give in to poor me. I'm going to take the initiative to grow because it's what I owe you and it's what I owe him. Hallelujah. You know, have you ever noticed like people that don't show up to church and don't go to church? Yes. And why, why aren't you going to church? Well, church is full of hypocrites. They live one thing in church and they live something else outside of church. They preach with their lips, but they don't preach with their life. Well, maybe they're just messed up people like every one of us growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And in the meantime, they're disobeying scripture because the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. And yet they're just living in isolation and calling out faults and flaws of the church. And even if those flaws and, and, and faults are, are real and true, it still doesn't take away from the personal responsibility to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you think that church is so messed up, well, why don't you go there and show them the grace and love of Jesus Christ? Why don't you be a living testimony of what it means? Because Jesus, not only does he love those who uh, seem to have it all together, he's, he loves those that have made a mess out of their life. He loves those that are hypocrites. He loves those that have fallen short time and time and time again. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what, what they do. And so if that's the heart of Jesus, that should be your heart too. And I get so tired of people. And when you're in church, I mean, you hear it all. When you're a pastor, you hear it all. You just hear bickering and complaining about the impact perfections of people and people it's almost like they take a polaroid of somebody's life and every every time you 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 gain some trajectory in your life they hold up that polaroid in your face to try to remind you of your past and and it, it's so hypocritical because if we were to take the faults and the flaws of each and every single one of us in this place and we were to show them up on this these screens for everybody to see nobody would want to talk to anybody Nobody would want to shake your hand. Nobody would want to sit next to you in church. Some of y'all, they might say something about on Facebook. 
But we're all messed up. We realize we're all messed up. I'd rather go to a messed up church that knows they're messed up, than they're, but they're depending on the grace of God, than a church that appears to be righteous, but it's a facade. And in reality, it's only self-righteousness. And they've got no love or grace for those who walk through the door, door who don't look like them and don't dress like them and don't live for them. We have been called to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ and to whom much is given, much is required. And so the more that you grow in love, the more you should be showing love. The more that you grow in grace, the more you should be showing grace. And so we in the church world, we've got to stop blaming everybody else. And we've got to look at the person in the mirror and make the personal decision. I'm going to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm going to allow Jesus to change me. I'm going to allow God to do what he wants to do in and through me. I'm going to stay on the wheel and allow the potter to mold me and make me and break me. Not my will, but your will be done, oh God. Hallelujah. I wasn't planning to preach on any of that, but I, I feel something there. I feel like I struck a chord there. You get tired of it. People pointing out the flaws of everybody else. You know, the Bible says, the Bible says when you see someone overtaken in a fall, you who are spiritual, if you truly are spiritual, then restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, lest you also be tempted. And so even if you see somebody who's overtaken in a fall, if you've got the grace and, 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 and love of Jesus flowing in you, then it should make you want to restore them and it should make you want to express the hands of Jesus to them. You know, I remember a prophecy that went forth one time where the Lord said, I'm going to send people from the north, the south, the east, and the west. But he said, just as I showed you love, I want you to show them love. Just as I showed you grace, I want you to show them grace. I pray every time somebody walks through this door that they're not met with a, a condescending spirit. Look at how good we are. Look at how messed up you are. I hope every person that walks through that door, they feel like they've been embraced by the body of Christ, that they've been loved by the body of Christ, that we didn't look at how they dress. We let them know Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus can change you from the inside out. You see, we haven't been called to clean up the fish. We've been called to be fish of men. We've been called to cast out the line to catch the fish, but Jesus does the cleaning up. Jesus does the sanctifying. Jesus does the growing. It's Jesus and Jesus alone that does a work from the inside out. He grows us in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But God places people in your life that have a set of experiences that you don't so that you don't have to learn every lesson the hard way. I think that some people honestly have the spirit of stubborn stupidity. Well, I've got to learn the lesson the hard way. Why? I've got to touch the stove to see if it's hot. I'm telling you, it's hot. No, I want to trust that God's going to put people in my life that will help to grow in wisdom and favor in stature with God and with others. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can I tell you, there is unlimited potential in this crowd, and God has placed his hand on each and every single one of you here tonight. And my invitation to you is to not allow the corporate growth of this church to overshadow the responsibility for the individual growth of its members. We have a responsibility to grow. I do. You do. We do. And as we make that commitment to go deep, God honors watch by growing wide. You know, we all want God to expand our, li our lives. God, enlarge our borders. God, enlarge our church. God, enlarge my ministry. Enlarge my influence. And God is saying, first, I want you to grow deep. I want you to be hidden in me. And as you're growing deeper in Jesus, God says, I'm going to let you grow wider. I'm going to give you a bigger impact. He said it like this. Those that are faithful in the small things is going to be given authority over 10 cities. You see, if we can't be faithful in little, then why would God give us more to squander? If we can't be faithful with the ministries and the churches that God has given to us now, then God, why would God give us more? God will give us a little at a time to see if we're going to trust him, to see if we're going to stay humble, to see if we're going to stay dependent upon him, to see if we're going to keep our trust in him, to see if we're going to keep our eyes on him. And God says, okay, now 
that you've handled that, now I can give you more. And I know it's not going to destroy you. I know it's not going to ruin you. I know it's not going to destroy the coal on your life. But God wants to bless you and he wants to bring increase. God doesn't just want to bring enough. He's a God of more than enough. God is a God of overflow. God is a God of blessing. Hallelujah. Give God a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. And so we've got to let God grow us in our heart. God to allow us to go deeper. We're going to grow in revival. But let me say this here tonight. Revival isn't growing. We're growing. We are growing into the already established reality of his kingdom advancing on earth. And more than me needing more of God, he needs more of me. And so we've got to grow up in this thing and in doing so, see our lives and our communities forever transformed. Verse 52, it says this, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Jesus was 100% God, but he is also 100% man. He lived as you and I lived. He had the Holy Spirit not only upon him, but he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's a whole other message. If God needed the Holy Spirit, how much more do you and I need the Holy Spirit? If God needed the power of the Holy Spirit working and flowing through him, how much more do you and I need the power of the Holy Spirit? If there's ever a time when the church needed the power of the Holy Spirit, it's 2023. Because I don't know if you've been watching the news lately. If you haven't, then praise God. But, you know, they're talking about all sorts of different things. You got, you got, you got earthquakes. You got hurricanes, hurricane after hurricane and wildfire after wildfire. You got people talking about UFOs and all these crazy things that are happening in the world but if there's ever a time when you ever needed the power of the holy spirit it's right now if you ever needed the grace of god working in your life it's right now i was talking to somebody earlier and and they were just they felt discouraged and they said just seems like things in in this world just keep getting worse and worse and it's hard to keep your head up sometimes I, i mean you know the last several years have been i feel like traumatic for the world It's like we haven't even processed everything that happened during COVID. And and here they are trying to bring back some more mandates back to our country. The devil's a liar. We will never comply. We're going to advance as the kingdom of God. And we're going to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not going to live in fear. We're not going to tremble at what's happening in this world. We're going to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Jesus Christ. And we're going to be full of the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to do everything that God... God has called us to do. And if that's your heart, I want you to give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah. <laughs> Tired of this country's news media just flooding this country with fear. Fear mongering. The more they make you fear, the more they control you. You've got to stand up to it eventually and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We're not going to focus on the darkness of this world, but the darker this world gets, the brighter the bride of Jesus Christ will shine. And we're going to keep going. We're going to keep preaching. The Bible says that this gospel of the kingdom shall go into all the earth as a witness to the nations. And then the end shall come. We're going to keep preaching. We're going to keep teaching. We're going to keep showing up to church. And we're going to do it boldly and we're going to continue to allow Jesus to do everything he wants to do in our life. Can you give God a hand clap of praise? If Jesus grew, then what's my excuse? What's your excuse? Hey, it's easy when you're in ministry to just feel like you got it all going on. I was telling the brothers here the other night. You know, sometimes in ministry, you're just trying to survive through the the heat of ministry. Leave alone, think about what needs to change within your heart. I mean, that's a whole nother level. But God doesn't just want us to survive ministry. He wants us to thrive throughout ministry. And he wants us to allow him to grow us so that we can be more effective in ministry. You know, I I made up in my mind, I've said it before, but before I ever started pastoring, I I told God, I said, you're more important than my ministry. And I said, I would step down from ministry if it meant saving my relationship with you. 
And really what that did is it put Jesus in the right perspective. Because whether you have a ministry or no ministry, whether you, you have a position or no position, a title or no title, if you've got Jesus, you've got everything you need. And if you allow Jesus to do his work in you and you'll stay hidden in Christ, then God will say that eventually there's going to be a time for you to shine. There's going to be a time for your gift to be used. There's going to be a time for your influence to grow. But we got to keep the first thing first. God said, you've got to come back to your first love. God cares more about the worker than the work. He cares more about the laborer than the labor. And how often do we just run ourselves dry? We're just like a hamster on a spin wheel. We just keep going and going and going and going. Just like the, the energizer bunny. We never stop. We just keep going. And the Bible says with Mary and Martha that, that Mary was just sitting at the feet of Jesus. Listening to his word. Martha got frustrated. Have you ever been around Christians that think everyone else should be doing all these different things? And, and Jesus was saying, hey, Mary has actually done the very thing I want her to do. She's sitting at my feet and just listening to my word. He said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part and it shall not be taken from her. Just sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to his word. Sometimes we got to cease from the labor and we just got to sit at the feet of Jesus and let Jesus speak to us and let Jesus grow us. If Jesus grew, then we need to grow too.